and welcome to the latest installation of our What's on Tap Happy Hour series. Today, we are honored to hear from New Rochelle Mayor Noam Bramson. We are lucky to have Christopher Dorosimi as our YP host of the evening. Chris is the Assistant Director for Government and Community Affairs at the Wildlife Conservation Society and member of the YP Steering Committee. Before I pass the screen to Chris to introduce Mayor Bramson, I'd like to remind everyone to promote Abney on social media at a better NY. Please remember to submit questions throughout the event via the Q&A function and we'll address them at the end of the event. Uh, thank you all so much for joining and without further ado, I'll pass the screen to Chris. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah, and welcome everyone to our latest installment for What's on Tap. Um, I'm Chris Dorosimi, a member of the ABNY Young Professional Steering Committee and Assistant Director for Government and Community Affairs for the Wildlife Conservation Society. We, we have been a continue to live in a in an unprecedented time with the, co with the coronavirus pandemic since March. New York State served as the epicenter of the crisis, leading the nation in both cases and unfortunately deaths. Our guest today, New Rochelle Mayor Norm Branson, was at the center of one of the first epicenters of the pandemic in America. Having served as New Rochelle's mayor since 2006, we will learn more about him, his personal and professional experience, his pivotal actions and his response to the pandemic, along with lessons learned, and his vision for the future of the state of New York. To give you a bit of background on Mayor Bramson, his start in electoral politics began at 25 years old when he was elected to the New Rochelle City Council, serving for 10 years. In 2006, Mayor Bramson was appointed to and wins a special election for the mayoralty. He, had, he then goes on to win decisively four consecutive terms. Throughout his tenure, he has spearheaded efforts to promote and implement policies that improve the environment, the economy, the infrastructure and overall quality of life, including New Rochelle's first ever sustainability plan, which contains specific recommendations to achieve these goals over the next 20 years. As Sarah mentioned, we have time for questions and answers, so please don't hesitate to submit questions throughout the conversation in the chat. Without further ado, New Rochelle Mayor, Noam Branson. Let's start by telling us a little bit more about yourself. Well, uh, first of all, Chris, thanks very much for, for the introduction. I'm, I'm really honored to have the opportunity to, to join the group. I told my kids that I would be speaking before a group of young professionals, and they expressed astonishment that you would have any interest in hearing from me. Um, they, they may still prove to be correct, who knows, but, but I'm glad to be with you, and it's a, it's a nice opportunity for me to speak to you in kind of a, an informal way. Um, and uh, I guess you, you sort of covered the... Uh, the, the basics of my, uh, my, my political biography. Uh, the only thing that I'll add is um, I sort of began to be interested in public service from a, from a pretty young age. Um, when I was, was growing up, it was always expected by my parents that we would arrive at the dinner table having read the newspaper, uh, ready to discuss uh, current events. Um, uh, you know, the notion that giving back to a community was part of being a complete human being was definitely inculcated at, at a young age. And uh, my parents came from the perspective of being uh, immigrants and refugees uh, who fled for their lives from, uh, from Europe in the Second World War. So they had a, a sort of a special reverence for the political process. Um, so I, I've always felt very lucky to be engaged in a field where it's possible to uh, act on those impulses. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, I studied government in college and in graduate school. And uh, as you pointed out, uh, sort of began working in this field from a, from a pretty young age and, and now I've been at it, I guess, most of my adult life and, and literally more than half of my life as a whole, which is a little bit weird and scary, but, uh, but here we are. Um, and I, I could certainly get into more detail or talk to you more about the nature of Nourishell, but I have a feeling that you probably want this conversation to be less about uh, my, my resume and, and more about sort of what's going on in our community. So I'll, I'll let you guide the discussion forward. Oh sure, sure. We'll we'll start with um we'll start with economic development. So in 2018, New Rochelle was awarded the $10 million downtown revitalization initiative by the state and was also chosen by Bloomberg Philanthropies as just one of nine cities nationwide to receive a million dollar grant for innovation. What do those grants mean for the city and how can we see their impact today? So those were really big wins for, for New Rochelle. Um, and they were wins on a couple of levels. First of all, uh, you know, those are big dollars for a city of our size. And, um, and so the material support in and of itself uh, has intrinsic value to us. Uh, in the case of the Downtown Revitalization Initiative, 
which as you pointed out is a $10 million grant from New York State. Uh, we are gonna be utilizing that uh, primarily to create something called the Link, which is a repurposing of a, a 1950s era urban renewal highway to nowhere uh, into a linear park. That will be a, a great open space asset for our community, uh, stimulus to further uh, private investment. Um, and, and by the way, will also be a particular benefit to a portion of our city uh, that has a, a disproportionately low income population. So it achieves uh, equity and social justice uh, purposes as well. And it's the sort of thing that we had conceived of some time before, but would have been difficult if not impossible for us to actually execute uh, without state support. Um, so uh, that's not completed to be clear. The process of um, you know, advancing the planning to the point where it can be executed and also going through the state process of uh, going from the award of funding to the actual delivery of the dollars. Uh, it requires some patience, particularly in, in the age of COVID, but we're definitely on a good track. And in the case of Bloomberg Philanthropies, uh, we're using that $1 million award to create um, an open source app that will utilize virtual reality to help people uh, better understand the manner in which proposed developments will change our built environment. Um, so rather than relying on the traditional form of public input, which is people show up at a public hearing, uh, which really excludes a big part of our population that just isn't interested in that form of engagement and often doesn't permit quality engagement. This will really be sort of more fun and interactive and will bring in younger people as well and permit people to give us feedback in a way that's, that's more actionable. So we're excited about it. And, and interestingly, these two initiatives may well merge because it's in the design of the link, the specific design of the link that we're probably gonna beta test um, this, uh, this open source app. So both of those things will, will end up uh, supporting each other. The other way in which those grants help us is really a sort of validation for the work that has already been underway. Um, we adopted back in late 2015, uh, the most ambitious development framework in our history, the largest in the Hudson Valley, uh, about uh, 12 million square feet of overall build out, 7,000 housing units. Uh, it's, now, it's now unfolding um, exactly as we had hoped. We've got four tower cranes in our downtown, so construction is, is going strong. But to have the work that we were doing, uh, which was enormously difficult, was enormously difficult to get to that point, to have it validated by third parties like New York State, like Bloomberg, through this incredibly competitive process. You know, in the case of the DRI, it's only one winner in our entire multi county region. In the case of Bloomberg, it was nine winners nationwide. Um, it feels really good. And it helps uh, residents of New Rochelle, not just government officials, but residents of New Rochelle, feel as though there's a sense of positive momentum in New Rochelle that's being recognized externally. And, um, and that helps us make further progress. So um, we're, we're very proud that we were able to accomplish that. Although again, we still have more work to do in order to realize the, the full scope of the possibilities ahead of us. That sounds great. That sounds great. Especially, you know, you're bringing government directly to the people as it pertains to younger voters, um, affordable housing. That sounds great. Let's get to the nitty gritty. Over the last few months, you know, since mid-March, what what were your first reactions to hearing that there was a coronavirus outbreak in your city? Uh, well, uh, it was surreal, um, and 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 shame on me in a sense for not having the imagination to expect it. Um, you know, we, we all were aware that the virus was spreading in Asia and in Europe. Uh, we had heard that it was beginning to have an impact in in Washington State, but even though there was, I think, an intellectual understanding that the virus could and probably would spread worldwide, it still seemed like a, a sort of distant, abstract problem. Um, and then receiving a call, which came from a New York City official, uh, about um, the outbreak of a case of a New Rochelle resident, uh, you know, was a shock. Um, and it was immediately clear to, to all of us here in city government and our partners at the county and state level uh, that would, it would require uh, the comprehensive focus uh, of all of us in, in the days ahead. Even, even though I, I think at that moment, we, 
recognizing it was enormously serious, we still did not fully understand the scale and scope and the duration of the challenge we would ultimately face. Um, so um, that was, um, you know, I will, for the rest of my life, I will remember March, 2020. Uh, like many of us will remember 2020 because it has been so strange, but it was particularly intense in New Rochelle because for a period of time, we were the center of attention for the country and to some degree for the world uh, of this global challenge. And so beyond the, the public health impacts and the disruption in daily life that everyone experienced, here in New Rochelle, we had to go through that under the glare of this really intense spotlight, uh, which made the which made the experience that much more more difficult. Well, and thank you for your efforts, and definitely being the first comes with its challenges. Um, but you were the site of the state's first drive-through COVID nineteen mobile testing center. You know, what was your involvement in creating that center, and what did you have to do to really mobilize that quickly? So on that score, I've got to give credit to the state. Uh, they were the ones who stood up that center. And, and to be clear, uh, public health functions outside of New York City are really aggregated at the county and the state level. So as a city official, I recognized it was not my role to be the primary actor in terms of setting up a testing regimen, in terms of making sure we had a contact tracing system, uh, in terms of promulgating guidelines. But it was very much our role to be an involved collaborator in all of these decisions, to help the state and the county understand a local perspective and local impacts. And uh, maybe most importantly uh, of all of these, sharing with our own community the information that, that people needed in order to protect their own health, in order to protect the health of their loved ones, and in order to face this challenge in a way that was measured and serious and mature and not panicked. Um, which in those early days, you know, it was a real concern that um, fear might be as much of an obstacle to sensible decision making as, uh, as the virus itself. Uh, so um, uh, myself, other city officials, uh, whether it was in direct communication with our residents through robocalls and other means, or through media appearances of a kind that, you know, a small city is not accustomed to, you know, 20 camera crews camped out uh, on our front lawn, uh, we were very much aware that every word we spoke uh, was enormously important in terms of mobilizing an appropriate community reaction. Uh, and we also had work to do uh, in terms of dealing with the sort of secondary impacts of the virus, not infections per se, but rather food insecurity, uh, disruption in, in daily life, the uh, sudden new pressures that were imposed on not-for-profit organizations, and uh, other entities that support uh, uh, the less privileged within our community. So helping to coordinate and support those efforts to deal with these suddenly burgeoning human needs, uh, that was a focus of our, of our efforts as well. Um, so, you know, I'm proud of the fact that we were able to work comfortably with the state and the county. You can imagine an alternative reality in which we would be at loggerheads um, or all trying to freelance instead of working in concert. But uh, I think because we had good pre-existing relationships and because we all understood our distinct uh, roles, related but distinct roles, uh, I think we were able to negotiate those very difficult first few weeks um, as successfully as could have been hoped. Most definitely, most definitely. And you, you just talked about how everything had to close, including cultural institutions and the like. As you have started to reopen, you know, how have schools been navigating remote hybrid session, um, hybrid learning and reopening writ large? It's been hard, I'll be honest. Um, so the New Rochelle Public Schools at this moment are still largely virtual. Uh, there are some students who have special learning needs who are able to uh, come in and be physically present because their educational requirements really compel it. Uh, but the vast majority of students are learning entirely virtually. Uh, our school district, which I should point out, is independent of the city government. So I'm not a policymaker in this area, but I'm certainly uh, an interested observer as a parent, among other things. Um, uh, our school district intends to go to a hybrid model uh, later this fall. Um, and uh, look, it impacts every family differently. Uh, my family, we're fortunate 
in that our kids are of high school age, so they're capable of being relatively independent. They can participate in virtual learning without constant parental supervision, uh, and they don't have special learning challenges. Um, uh, so for parents of younger kids or, or parents of uh, uh, kids who are involved in special education, uh, I recognize the burdens are, are exponentially greater. Um, and it's, it's been a real challenge for everyone to, to make it work logistically, to anticipate the public health impacts that may come from bringing too many people together too soon, and to recognize that there's a kind of an inherent instability in all of this. Um, you know, you can set up a perfect system and then a few people test positive, and, uh, and those best laid plans have to be uh, recalibrated. So we know we're not really going to get back to anything resembling normal until there's a widely available vaccine. And uh, until that point, we're all struggling to find the least bad option um, that um, it most closely resembles, but doesn't quite make it to normal life. Touching on your point on, you can do everything perfectly, but you still that one positive case. Right now we have an, a resurgence of cases in different clusters throughout the state, including um, you know, several New York City resulting in certain rollbacks. What will be your response should a resurgence happen in New Rochelle? Well, so, First, just to put that in context, um, compared to where we are, were in the spring, uh, Nurshell is vastly better off. Uh, at the peak of the virus, we had more than a thousand active cases in Nurshell. That means cases that had been diagnosed within the prior two weeks, uh, which would make our infection rate among the highest in the world. Um, so that was an unsettling uh, time for us. Right now, we're, we're far, far below that by, by more than an order of magnitude. Yet we are seeing an uptick over the last few weeks, uh, which I'll be honest is concerning to me. Uh, I don't see, nor do county health authorities see uh, the sort of consistent pattern in that data that would enable us to uh, identify sort of a precise cluster or a precise reason for this outbreak. And the numbers are still low enough that it could be statistical noise because we recognize that there is a sort of degree of things bouncing around, but it definitely bears watching. And it is possible, whether Nourishell or elsewhere, that at some point the data will compel a closure again. And uh, if that's the case, then we'll do what we can to make it work. I, I, one thing I admire about the state and how they've approached this, and I give credit to the governor, is they have been very data-driven. They've been clear and transparent about the metrics they're using uh, to determine what should happen and when. Uh, I think by and large, those standards have been sensible and have been grounded in, in science and public health. And uh, I am not gonna second guess them. Uh, so uh, if, and I hope this doesn't occur obviously, and we're not there yet, but if our numbers increase to the point uh, where a closure is necessary, as I said, we will, we will do what we can to support that. In the meantime, the best thing we can do is, and I, I realize I'm a broken record because everyone's saying this, is you know, wash our hands, wear a mask. If you're sick, don't show up to work, uh, social distance. Uh, do all those responsible actions that can prevent a problem from exploding. It's much better to do this in advance than to try to play catch up after the fact. And, and those of us in leader, leadership positions uh, and I say this with one eye towards 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, those of us in leadership positions, I think have a special responsibility to model the behavior that we are encouraging in others. Because when we fail to do that, we send the sort of mixed messages that make a coordinated community and national response uh, much more difficult than it ought to be. Thank you, thank you. We've received a question from one of our um, audience members. How is the real estate market in New Rochelle, particularly given the recent trend by city residents moving out of the city since the pandemic? Extremely strong. Uh, now, this is not the vehicle through which we would want to get a strong real estate market, let me be clear. Uh, but it is uh, one of the few silver linings for New Rochelle and for uh, the suburbs generally uh, in, uh, in the COVID outbreak. Uh, realtors tell me uh, that this is the strongest market they've seen in memory, uh, both in terms of de demand level and in terms of, of pricing. Uh, so it's, it's clearly a seller's market. Um, I, I hasten to add though, I, I suspect that is really kind of a short-term trend. Uh, I think it's probably a lot of families who might've chosen to leave the city in two or three years are instead accelerating that decision. And I think, and frankly hope, 
that ultimately uh, New York City will fully recover. Um, you know, uh, there are all the things that made New York City appealing in 2019 will continue to make New York, uh, New York City appealing in 2021. Um, and, and for New Rochelle, although our market is moving in a counter cyclical way at this moment with New York, vis-a-vis -vis New York, ultimately we're gonna move in concert with New York. Strengthen the New York City market is good for New Rochelle. And um, our overall vision for the downtown, which I referenced earlier, all these new housing units, uh, I do think that we want, we want um, a dense, urbanized, culturally exciting, mass transit uh, dependent, less car dependent, energy efficient communities like that to succeed. And that's just as true in Manhattan and Brooklyn and Queens as it is in downtown New Rochelle. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm bullish about our market short term. I'm bullish long term. It's the medium term that's a question mark that's extremely difficult to predict right now. But at least so far, it's the last point I'll make on this score. For the folks who are actually doing the big investment, uh, the developers who are placing uh, bets in the hundreds of millions, uh, they're not pulling back at all. They're moving forward gangbusters. So at least by that metric, uh, there's a sense of confidence that when all the dust clears from COVID, uh, the trends that made us confident about New Rochelle previously will continue to make us confident going forward. Nice. Do you have any data on the number of city residents that have moved to New Rochelle since March? I don't. That's a good question. Um, and um, it probably is not possible to get a precise number, but I bet we could get a good approximation. And your question will prompt me to see if we can figure that out. All right. All right. Um, oh, the questions are now coming in. Nice. Um, I have a resident in Westchester County who applaud and appreciate your leadership, especially at the onset of COVID. Um, he says that you were the first one to do so effectively. And to that end, what lessons will you have for other cities across the US um, and throughout the rest of the state, being that you were one of the first epicenters? What lessons can you share with us? Well, uh, first of all, I, I very much appreciate the compliment. Um, you know, given how difficult it was to get that kind of feedback, as you might imagine, is um, it's uh, it's gratifying and it's a relief. Um, look, I'd say, uh, and and none of this is particularly original, but uh, one, be transparent and honest. Be clear about what you know and what you don't know, and uh, particularly in the latter case, provide context. Um, when when you're going through a crisis, people want to understand the landscape and expect people in leadership positions uh, to, to be able to explain that landscape with as much clarity and honesty as possible. Um, and second, uh, it is to try to demonstrate the same sense of calm and composure that you expect of others, even if you have to fake it a little bit. Uh, I mean, you know, to be honest, I had some sleepless nights early on. Um, I remember having conversations with our city manager in which we were together reviewing all sorts of worst case scenarios, uh, none of which we thought were probable, but which suddenly seemed very plausible. You know, what are we gonna do if there are food riots? What are we gonna do if the, uh, if the, if the virus decimates our public safety workforce and we lack the capacity to provide basic policing? Uh, what are we going to do if, if uh, the level of business distress is such that our budget collapses entirely? I mean, the kinds of discussions, particularly with respect to civil unrest, that, that I never expected to, to have in my capacity as mayor. Now, fortunately, none of those things came to pass. Um, you know, as bad as it was, and it was bad, and the worst thing, of course, is that there are lots of families still in mourning for, for loved ones, uh, the scenarios I describe right now never came to pass. Uh, nor did our hospitals get overwhelmed. Our healthcare system was able to accommodate the, the surge that, that, that occurred. But, but um, that kind of thought process of going there to that dark place, uh, it was very difficult. And yet, despite that, in every public appearance I made, I always wanted to uh, present a sense of calm assurance that this was tough, but that we were going to be able to face it successfully. And uh, with the hope that the community I serve would adopt the same perspective and the same attitude um, so that we wouldn't um, uh, fall into a sort of self-defeating mindset of, of panic and fear.
I, I lost your sound there. Oh, Zoom. <laughs> Before there was the New York Tough ban um, banner and mantra going around the state, there was New Rose Strong. And over the last few weeks, there's been business after business and front lawn supporting those signs. Um, can you share with us how the community has really come together over the last several months? Yeah, that's really, you know, it's great. And, and again, New Rochelle's not alone in this regard. I, you know, it's my job to be a spokesperson for my city and sort of beat my chest about how great we are. So I realize we're not alone, but I think we're a great example of something that, that has occurred elsewhere. And it's that, you know, when, in this moment of crisis, people really came together. You know, there was this outpouring of volunteerism, as I said before, not for profit organizations and community agencies. They rose to the occasion in a way that was just heroic. Uh, the city, I think, did a great job of maintaining essential services under very difficult circumstances. So everybody really did their part. And New Row Strong was just sort of a hashtag and a slogan all aimed at um, encapsulating that feeling. Um, and we wanted people to display their pride. Uh, so we, you know, we produced lawn signs and, and signs that people could post in their businesses and made them available free of charge. And thousands and thousands of them uh, were, were put up. And so if you, you drive through New Rochelle right now, you know, you'll see New Row Strong, um, like on, on lots and lots of properties. And, um, and it's great to see. And, and we also linked it to something else, which I'll mention. Uh, I said that the, the signs were free, but they came with an option to make a voluntary contribution to a program called Nourish All, which was kind of a, a, a play on sounding a little like New Rochelle, Nourish All. Um, and through that program, which also involved contributions from developers, some very generous contributions. We purchased gift cards from local restaurants that were struggling, obviously, because they couldn't do business in a normal way. And we distributed those gift cards to community agencies that serve people who are food insecure. So these were, I mean, it, the total cost of the program was uh, nearly a million dollars. It was in the high six figures. Um, and it was a real lifeline to families who were struggling, um, and to restaurants who needed the support. And it's still going on. We're still continuing with the program into the fall. And uh, I, I'm, I'm digressing, I realize, a little bit. But the way I got to this is through the sign up for a, a Neuro Strong sign, we raised tens of thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars from people who didn't have to, but just said, yeah, I'm going to contribute to this program. And it's, again, an illustration of the degree to which uh, people, people really came together. And a, a couple of other examples. This was like really moving to me kind of early on. Uh, you know, uh, in the first stage of this crisis, it, it seemed mistakenly in retrospect, but it seemed like the outbreak was confined to a, a particular religious congregation in, in a part of our city. Uh, and then something called the containment zone was established by the state, which, which maybe we'll get into. And so a lot of people were sort of literally afraid to be in that neighborhood or had the mistaken impression that it was sort of uh, uh, cordoned off by the National Guard, that it was sort of an exclusion zone, uh, which is not a rational response. And so uh, without you know, informing the city, without telling anyone, our local Girl Scout crew uh, went around in this neighborhood, putting up purple ribbons, demonstrating support for their neighbors, which was like such a moving thing for everyone. It's like, we're, we're not gonna let this tear us apart we're not gonna, we're gonna be careful and cautious, but we're not gonna be irrationally afraid. And we're gonna show that we care about each other. And then in response, the members of this congregation who were so moved, they took it upon themselves to raise thousands of dollars to support the Girl Scouts. And it's like, you know, it's sort of love begets love and good begets good. And it's nice to be able to see that and be reminded of that, even in the middle of something that is such a painful experience. It definitely gives you that silver lining, that glimmer of hope, or rather that light at the end of the tunnel, as I'm throwing out different mantras, but it's definitely heartwarming and, and definitely, I would say, tear jerking, um, for lack of a better term, to see how the community actually comes together to really, you know, alleviate some of the hysteria and pain that's going on around us. Yeah. Um, I know you mentioned, you know, even developers chipping in and everything like that. Have developers come to the city with any changes to their plans based on potential changes in the market needs brought on by COVID? So for the most part, no. Um, uh, as I, I think I mentioned earlier, the, most of the developments that have been approved are proceeding on schedule. Uh, 
the construction in our downtown is literally unprecedented. We've never seen uh, so much going on uh, simultaneously. Uh, there are changes in demand patterns that are evident. So for example, prior to COVID, we saw the greatest demand for studio and one bedroom apartments. Now we're seeing greater demand for two and three bedroom apartments, sort of larger family sizes, people thinking of, uh, you know, again, it's not just singles moving out, it's families who wanna expand into the suburbs. I, I suspect again, that that will be a short-term shift in demand rather than long-term. So I don't think that's likely to result in a change in how uh, projects are constructed. Uh, in other cases, uh, we have, just as an example, one project that's, that's two phases. The first phase is topped off and, uh, and is, is nearing completion. The second phase may ultimately get repositioned to be a condo project rather than a rental project. And the developer is gonna wait until the market settles down a little bit um, so that they can make a more intelligent judgment about which way to proceed. But there's no shyness about the fact that there will be a phase two. So um, uh, the, the sort of basic proposition of, are we gonna invest in New Rochelle? That's not in doubt. Uh, what may shift is how do we adjust our product so that it best ma matches an evolving market. Okay. Uh, somebody asked, what are the main community needs of New Rochelle residents with regards to public spaces? Uh, so, um, in order to answer that question, I think I have to first say, for those who are not familiar with New Rochelle, uh, we are incredibly diverse. Uh, and I mean that by every metric, um, demographic characteristics, socioeconomic characteristics, and land use. So there are portions of our city that are classic suburbia. You know, probably half of our land area is single family homes, both pre-war and, and post-war. Um, and with sort of extensive properties and so on. And, and for folks like that, although they certainly are still enjoying parks and want parks and want public spaces where we can all gather, uh, the need is not as acute because uh, you know, there's open space available outside their front and back doors. Uh, for the other uh, roughly half of our city, uh, it's much more dense, much more urbanized, uh, multifamily. And in cases like that, the importance of public open space is obviously uh, somewhat greater. Um, so uh, we're lucky that we have an extensive park system already uh, of many hundreds of acres and parks of different types, some active uh, playing fields and so on, others passive and wooded. Uh, you know, when you're in the interior of them, you have no sense of proximity to any development at all, which is a nice uh, sort of uh, escape. Uh, but I'll readily succeed, uh, uh, readily uh, acknowledge that especially as we increase the population in our downtown, open space, additional open space needs to be a part of that. So we do already have a one acre park called the Ruby D Park named after uh, the famous actress who was a resident here, uh, which is in the heart of our downtown. Uh, in conjunction with a couple of our projects, we are either creating new or upgrading existing public plazas, um, which I think will be welcome additions. And uh, the biggest one, which I mentioned earlier is the link uh, which is this nearly half mile, maybe more than half mile, I have to remind myself, um, a linear park uh, that um, will be uh, the biggest new open space asset in New Rochelle in my lifetime. Um, so that, that will be um, a, an exciting addition to our community. Okay. Let's, going on to criminal justice reform. Somebody would love to know, how is the New Rochelle Police ensuring stronger compliance with criminal procedure laws? Well, so look, this is, a, this is an important challenge that I think every community, every American is, is facing right now. Um, it's, it's not a new challenge, but obviously greater awareness, greater sensitivity, greater urgency uh, following uh, the death of George Floyd and so many other incidents which have occurred tragically uh, around the country. And it's resulted in a lot of introspection on an individual level and on an institutional level. Uh, so our police department has historically already been one that is committed to strong community relationships, um, uh, engages uh, leadership in, in portions of our city where there's a greater interest in issues of, of criminal justice uh, and has training that emphasizes the importance of de-escalation, uh, that has careful restrictions on use of force, including prohibitions on, on chokeholds. So uh, many of the measures that are recommended by reformers 
uh, I'm happy to say, are already in place in New Rochelle, and the use of deadly force is extremely rare. Now, having said that, our department needs to improve like every department needs to improve. Um, and uh, to that end, uh, we have established a policing review committee uh, composed of uh, 15 volunteers, uh, coordinated by uh, one of our city council members, uh, and assisted by representation from the police department, which is um, embedded within their discussions in order to provide feedback and input. Uh, we are expecting that they will provide at least uh, preliminary recommendations uh, later this month. Uh, and this is also occurring under the uh, framework of the governor's executive order, which requires an, an analysis like this among all public safety agencies. Uh, and that, uh, that executive order runs through April. So it's my hope that um, we can take a good department and make it into a better department um, and do more to uh, help all members of our community feel uh, with their minds and in their hearts that their police department is there to serve them um, and to serve them with respect uh, and a sense of dignity that should be afforded to every one of our residents, no matter who they are, where they come from, what their background may be. Uh, I think that's a sort of standard of justice that all of us need to aspire to, and that too often uh, our country has, uh, has not attained. I think you're muted again. Yeah, uh, the trial of Zoom calls. <laughs> Wanted to pivot back to a little bit towards um, businesses and property owners. What are your priorities for supporting local business and property owners during this time and as we recover or look to recover? So uh, it's, a, it's a critically important question because obviously um, the economic pressure on so many small businesses is intense, uh, as it is on many people who are out of work, uh, who have found the federal lifelines either to be insufficient or have already been exhausted and uh, need to be renewed and haven't yet. Um, and uh, it, we all have a stake in making sure that our neighbors don't fall off a cliff and that as many businesses as possible uh, succeed and survive and make it through the other side so that we have a, a thriving economy. So, um, you know, we approach this on multiple levels uh, and we do so with partners in the Chamber of Commerce and the county government and a, a dedicated official here in City Hall who we call a, a business ambassador. Uh, and our business improvement district, which is a, you know, it's a, like the Grand Central Partnership. It's a bid. It, it, uh, it, um, it's sort of a quasi-governmental entity that, that uh, uh, operates within the commercial sector. So we're working with all of them to provide information about sources of outside assistance that might be available and to provide direct assistance. Um, so we have a program called Rebound New Rochelle, which makes grants available uh, to qualified businesses, and it uses two revenue streams, the Federal CARES Act, which comes with certain restrictions that make it a little bit more challenging to employ, and uh, contributions principally from RxR Realty, which is our master developer. They made a, a million dollar commitment to New Rochelle early on, which we very much appreciated. And so we've been able to provide uh, dozens of grants uh, to uh, two small businesses in New Rochelle, uh, which I think has been very helpful in, in keeping them afloat. And we also try to remind our residents that this is a time when if you can support your local business, even if it's shopping remotely, shopping online, taken out from a restaurant, uh, you know, uh, there's an extra reason to do so now. You always want to support local businesses, but now it's, it's particularly important. I know like our family, we're, we're taking out more than we ever did before which we kind of enjoy anyway, but you know, it's sort of like we do it with greater regularity uh, because we're sort of mindful of the importance of, of supporting our, our, our restaurant tours. Uh, and, and lastly, um, on, this, on this issue, I do think we can do more, and this is by the way, uh, this is not just a COVID issue, but a general issue. Even as we're sort of encouraging uh, new construction, new investment, uh, when people are able to acquire and aggregate properties for that purpose. I do think we can provide more, more robust incentives for people to adaptively reuse and repurpose uh, older buildings. And so to that end, we're sort of looking at, at, at uh, new uh, initiatives under the umbrella of our industrial development agency, our IDA, uh, which maybe can take the, the package and schedule of incentives that usually attaches to new growth 
and make it available also to rehabilitation. And uh, I think that will be enormously helpful to some of the property owners. And we'll also have the ancillary benefit of enabling us to take some of our historic architecture, which is real value, and, uh, and bringing it up to um, uh, modern standards of usability so that we'll have sort of a harmony between new growth and, and the old city and sense of place that comes with that old city that many people rightly feel attached to and don't want to lose. Okay. Can you expand a little bit more on Rebound New Rochelle? I know in addition to the grants, what are more of the priorities that um, this initiative has? So in, in addition to the business grants uh, that I mentioned, uh, we also have a residential component, uh, which uh, provides rental assistance to qualified residents who, um, uh, who are low income and are having trouble meeting their rent. And that's important even while uh, statewide eviction prevention protections are, are in place, because we should remember that those eviction prevention uh, measures do not excuse people from rent. It simply defers their rent obligations. And so there's a real danger that when those protections uh, run out, that you'll have a, a large group of people who have gotten so behind on their rent obligations and literally don't have the means to, uh, to make their landlords whole. Um, and also landlords, which are often portrayed as the bad guys, we should remember a lot of them are you know, small men and women, uh, not physically small, but small property owners, you know, one, two, not one family, two family, three family, six family uh, dwelling units um, uh, that are really dependent on that rental income to pay their mortgage and to pay their property taxes. So it's, it's hard all around. Um, and so we, we are trying to the best we can um, make the funds we have available uh, to help alleviate that problem. Now, I don't want to overstate what we're able to do as a municipality. The, the problem is much, much larger than the resources we have at our disposal, which, it's why, which is yet another reason why it's so critical for the federal government to do more than it has and to produce a, a comprehensive relief and stimulus package of the kind that has eluded them up until now. Uh, but we're trying to do what we can locally um, to at least alleviate the problem to some degree. And I think every little bit helps. Yes. So um, another person asks, I know public assets like public libraries and community centers have been closed due to COVID. Are there ways in which these community gathering places could play a role in New Rochelle's recovery? Uh, the answer is certainly yes. Now, um, some community gathering places have remained open with restrictions in place. And, um, and that's been vital uh, for dealing with the food insecurity issues that I, I mentioned. We have large soup kitchens, large social service providers that, um, and, and by the way, the staff and volunteers at those groups have been such heroes over the last few months because their workload has been off the charts. And yet they've really, they've really come through for us. So, uh, so they are, they are and have been playing a vital role, but even the ones that um, are, are not operating fully, like for a long time, our, our library was closed. Um, uh, you know, they're able to provide books and movies online, which, you know, we need more than ever when we're, we're cloistered at home. And uh, the library has also been, and we hope to do more of this, by the way, uh, we're kind of figuring it all out. Uh, they've been also helpful in distributing Wi-Fi hotspots, which you know are an important piece of sort of digital inclusion, um, particularly important for youngsters who are engaged in virtual learning, but important for for others as well. So yes, even um, under these constrained circumstances where the sort of normal operation is not possible, uh, it, it, it there clearly are ways in which these institutions can and are playing a critical role in supporting the community as a whole. Okay. Uh, and I would also like to add to that, how about like culturals and artists and whatnot? What, what, is, what is happening with them or how are they being supported during this time as well? So I'll give you one just great example, only because it's fresh in mind. Um, uh, yesterday, I have to like, like calibrate. Yesterday, uh, I had a tour of a newly opened uh, development called Neuro Studios. Um, and uh, this is a, I think, a six-level uh, rental building, uh, about 100 units, um, that is being marketed specifically to artists. And in fact, the affordable units within it uh, are reserved exclusively for artists. 
Um, and so in addition to the apartments, there is shared workspace, there is shared gallery space, there's a, a soundproof recording studio, um, and the, the building is filled with murals that were produced by an artist who was retained uh, by the builders, many of which commemorate Nourishell's role and experience in the pandemic uh, in a positive way. You know, it's not, it's not a downbeat kind of experience. It's rather oh. a community that, that came together and, and rose to the occasion. And uh, to me, that's, um, it's a wonderful illustration of what we can do in our planning goals to encourage and promote creativity and give artists a, a stake and a place where they can be in our city. And for artists in turn, to give back to the spirit of the, the city that we're all sharing through their own cultural contributions. Uh, and I hope that um, that won't prove to be sort of a, a standalone example, but rather an illustration of something that's occurring more broadly in New Rochelle. Okay. That, that's great. That is actually very great in terms of creating a, a space and a haven for, you know, artists and whatnot to actually continue to thrive. Um, you spoke about the impressive quick response to the COVID outbreak back in March. Are there systems of information sharing in place to communicate those responses to city, state leaders, as, and other municipalities as they deal with outbreaks of their own? I mean, I suppose so. Look, I over the course of the year, uh, all of us have put in place um, data collection and analysis and communication protocols uh, that initially had to sort of be constructed on the fly and gradually were refined and systematized. And I think all that's in place right now. And my impression is that public health authorities are constantly learning from each other. So the, the framework in New York State may be different from the one in New Jersey and Connecticut and Florida and California, but uh, best practices are, are constantly being shared uh, one to the other. Um, and I think that will have to continue. Uh, but certainly, um, whereas early on, this all had kind of an ad hoc feel, you know, we were sort of building the plane as we were flying it. Uh, now, uh, even though we're definitely not done with this challenge, uh, it's reassuring to feel as though we have a much better command of what's going on and how to how to measure it and how to respond to whatever changing trends uh, uh, we detect. And by the way, I should say, like, I, I, I want to acknowledge something honestly. Like, we're, we're talking about our success in facing this. Uh, by another standard, we kind of miss things. Um, you know, our initial impression was that we had a, a localized outbreak that could be contained through sensible measures. You know, the analogy I've often used is it was a kitchen fire that we could, we could knock down with a hand extinguisher and keep it from spreading out around the house. In retrospect, it was already in the ducts and the walls. The fire was already everywhere, it just hadn't been detected yet. And so the impression that it was kind of, well, it started in New Rochelle and it's gonna move elsewhere, what we know now is that by the time the first case was found in New Rochelle, there were probably already 10,000 cases in New York City. Um, and so all of us collectively were behind the eight ball. We, we misunderstood the nature of the problem in those early days. I do not say that to cast any blame at all, uh, because I think everyone was making the best decisions they could, sensible decisions, given the information available to them. And, and given uh, our collective sort of tolerance for immediate extreme measures, which I think would not have been there. And I think the governor in particular deserves enormous credit for sort of managing the state uh, with enormous skill and fortitude uh, from, from beginning to end. But having said all that, there was this fundamental sort of misapprehension of what was going on, um, which um, enabled the virus to get ahead of us in those early days in a way that I think we would not allow today with our better understanding and our better measurement of, of the facts on the ground. Definitely, definitely. And as we wind down, we have an audience of young professionals here. What advice do you have for people who want to become more civically engaged, especially now that through this pandemic, through social justice issues, you have a, a myriad of young people looking to become more involved. What advice would you have for them? So, First of all, please act on that impulse. Um, you know, it's no secret that this is a, 
this is a really tough time for our politics. Um, we, are, we are more divided than we've ever been. Uh, there's an ugliness to the way we communicate with each other that is more intense than, than anything I've seen. Um, you know, there's, you know, many people are rightly concerned about the prospect of violence uh, surrounding the, the election this November, uh, whichever way it goes. I don't remember that being a strand in our civic conversation ever before, not in my lifetime. And there are two ways to respond to that. One is to retreat from it and say, it's all a mess. And I can't bear to hear one more minute of, of a politician talking. And uh, I'm just going to focus on my own affairs and my own family and my own career. And the other way is to pour yourself into it and engage and say, we, we're better than this. And I'm going to be part of the improvement. I'm going to be part of the positive change. I, I'm going to do it through my actions and through my behavior and, and through uh, uh, demonstrating through my own comportment. Um, that there's a, a better way for us to be, um, to make a difference civically. So, you know, I, I just hope that, that you will take that second approach. And, um, and there's no one right avenue. You know, I, I mean, it, it can be engaging on social media in a way that's positive and fact oriented. Uh, it can be making absolutely sure that you vote and that your families vote. Uh, and it can be running for office. You know, there's no, um, uh, there's no qualifying test for running for office. There's no particular set of experiences or credentials you need. You just have to put yourself out there, you know, uh, have a set of ideas, know what it is you want to accomplish, uh, meet as many people as you can and communicate those values and goals with whatever clarity you can muster. Um, and then you get a front row seat in the policy making that can, can make your community better and, and your country better. So I'm just, I, I'm, I'm making an appeal for engagement and, and for recognizing that it's not naive to set aside cynicism. You can be realistic and idealistic at the same time. Those are not mutually exclusive postures and perspectives. And that I think for us all to be successful, uh, we have to be both realistic and idealistic. That, that's definitely, you know, I think Barack Obama said it best, you know, the system doesn't work if everybody opts out, right? That's right. So, That's right. and, you know, to your point of, you know, running for office and being in a room where it happens, quoting Hamilton, what's next for you? Uh, I, I'm not being cutesy when I say I really don't know. Um, uh, this is my fourth full term. That's a long time to serve as mayor. Um, and I, I still, I'm enormously grateful for this job and love it and feel like I'm providing value added to my community. Uh, but I'm, you know, I also am mindful of the fact that this is not the sort of position one should occupy forever. Um, uh, I still am very much in love with public service. Um, and in truth, it's the only thing I've ever wanted to do, which I don't say with any pride. I think that's a little weird. Um, you know, probably one should at least uh, in one's imagination, explore different potential career paths, but I, I never did. <laughs> um, but I, I really don't know. It's not as though there's some other office that obviously presents itself um, for which I would be a plausible candidate. And I'm also mindful of the fact that one should not be so fixated on the next rung of the ladder that you lose your footing on the rung you occupy now. Um, you know, I've got a job to do here in Rochelle, and that's my primary responsibility. And if that ultimately leads to some other position, uh, so be it. But um, that should not be my primary focus. All right, and those, those are some great words. You have a bold vision. You've been doing the work on the ground and while still looking ahead. Um, definitely, if there are no other questions that do come in, definitely thank you for spending the time with us today, sharing your ideas, the work by which you um, have done. And again, thank you so much. Well, thank you. It really was truly a pleasure. Thank you for the great questions. And, and uh, I'm, I'm honored that so many of you were willing to spend an hour with me. That's, um, that's meaningful. And um, uh, I'll be sure to tell my kids that you stuck around. <laughs> oh, wait, I actually have one more question. <laughs> um, can you elaborate on your comment about mixed messaging on use of masks? Is, a, is the mask a political statement or a health issue? Mask is a public health issue. 
I mean, I think this is one of the craziest debates that America has ever had. We've got every credible public health professional telling us that wearing a mask uh, can protect our own health and maybe even more importantly, protect the health of others by making it less likely that we will transmit the virus to others. Um, it is shocking to me that that should be a matter of political debate, that there should be different opinions about those facts expressed on average by Democrats and Republicans, or that there should be office holders who would intentionally see doubts about the public health measures that all of us need to embrace if we're gonna overcome this challenge and get to a better place. It is, um, it is such a catastrophic failure of leadership from the very top, which was illustrated yet again this very week. Um, and, uh, and we are paying the price in terms of tens of thousands of people who are dying needlessly. I'm not saying the virus was caused by it, but it's worse than it would have been because of this. Tens of thousands of needless deaths, delays in our economic recovery, which are impacting countless families and countless businesses, and a degree of division that is completely contrived. You know, in prior crises, we've come together as a country. We've recognized a sense of common purpose. We've all been willing to make individual sacrifices for the greater good. And it feels like um, while that is true for many people, many people in our country, I'd say the majority of people in our country, uh, it's not true for, for many others. And that's because they are taking uh, these horribly irresponsible cues from leaders who should know better and whose job it is to know better. All right. Um, and I think with that, I will turn it back over to Sarah to wrap it up. I'd just like to thank you again so much, Mayor Bramson, for coming. And thank you, Chris, for moderating. This was really so informative and we really appreciate it and hope everyone continues to be uh, neuro strong and New York tough. So have a great evening, everyone. And thanks for joining.